in the past few days, the Prime Minister has announced his roadmap to ease lockdown restrictions, but it's left many people confused about the guidelines and worried for their safety. Well, here to explain more about Britain's fight against the coronavirus is Health Secretary Matt Hancock. Morning, Matt. Thank Good you very morning. much for joining Thank us. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, Thank you. You, were, you probably will have seen the show yesterday. We, like a lot of people, were really very confused by what we'd heard. It didn't appear very clear at all. I know that today you're trying to clarify everything. We also are fully aware that you've never done this before. No-one's been through this before, to lock a country down and then attempt to unlock it. But do you agree that yesterday the government confused us? Well, I'm here to try to make sure everybody get, uh, understands as best as possible what we're trying to achieve. But do you, uh, uh, do you agree that yesterday if, the government confused us? Uh, uh, well, I think that we were quite clear. I did see the clip on the internet of, um, uh, of some of your frustration, uh, Philip, and so I thought the best thing to do was just to come on and answer the questions directly and make sure that your viewers get it straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, what we're trying to... Should it have been... Should the way the way it should have been announced was that there shouldn't have been that 24-hour vacuum of information that the Prime Minister went on TV and then the 50-page document was released and then you go to Parliament? Wasn't it just that it was the wrong way round, that what you, what you do is you release the document so everyone can have a look... Uh, then you go to Parliament and discuss it so we can hear, and then the Prime Minister tells us what's going to happen. And then we at least have some sort of idea, rather than some scale that looks like a Nando's heat-scoring um, graphic or, or there being confusion when Matt Lucas doesn't need to put out a video saying, go out, stay in, go to work, don't go to work. You know, it, 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 then that's how the nation felt. Well, I don't actually buy that. I've been talking to my constituents... Uh, over the last couple of days about this, and uh, they get it and they understand what stay alert means. And um, what we're trying to do is communicate the substance of the changes uh, and what people need to do as clearly as possible based on, the, based on principles which people really get. And, you know, and we've got to rely, on, all of us, on each other's common sense to get us through this. That's played a big part in the last six weeks. Uh, people have really exercised common sense. We're trying to guide as best as possible. And, you know, it's really easy for people to get caught up in the, you know, exactly what order should the prime minister have made his comments? Should he have gone to parliament before he did a piece to the BBC and, uh, and broadcast? Really, what matters is the substance. And I, I totally understand how people are uh, yearning for information about how they can um, do their best. Uh, and that's what I'm I here think, to... I, think uh, I, I appreciate, I very much appreciate that. I think what people were yearning for was clarity. What, what it did do, it made us look like, all the way through, we've watched and thought, OK, they know what they're doing, they know what they're doing, they know what they're doing. And then you've got uh, Dominic Raab, who goes on, on BBC and says you can meet one parent. Oh, no, you can meet, meet two parents. No, 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 you can, you can only meet one parent. And we think, oh, hold on a second, they haven't got a hand on the tiller. They don't know what they're doing. Well, why don't you ask me the questions and then we can uh, get through all of that. All I think right, that's, fair enough. I think that's, that's, how can, here's, your, here's your first question. How can I... Uh, have I got to pick between parents? How can I can't meet one parent uh, side by side with the other parent, yet I can hire a cleaner? The answer to that is that one at a time is fine. And with all of these judgments are balanced judgments within the big picture of us trying to keep the R rate down to stop the virus getting out of control um, and with the principles that um, you shouldn't see people who you don't have to. We've got to keep the hygiene stuff going. A lot of people, you know, reminding people about washing your hands and cleaning surfaces is really important. And then also, um, uh, also another critical part of it is that outside is better than inside. The, the virus does pass on outside, but much, much less than than inside. So the reason we came to that judgment that you asked me about is that large groups gathering is not good. So we had to have a judgment of at some, you know, what level. But for people's and actually, mental what, health, it's a mental it, health thing, really, it, isn't it? it? We, we, we appreciate, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I mean, uh, uh, yeah. when, you look at, when you look at family, I mean, I can understand the regulations very clearly with common sense and social distancing with one friend, you know, you meet one person. When yeah. it comes to parents, we've been separated for such a long time that if you were, you're actually asking us to pick a parent... One at a time, Philip. So you can see one and then you can see the other, um, and that's fine. And we are well, another thing we're looking at is whether two households can come together and interact 
a lot more, but we need to do some more science on the impact that that would have on the spread so of the can virus. I, can I, I see the parent, my parents like 10 minutes apart? Yes, yeah, so long as it's only one at a time, that's fine. But don't you see um, that that's utterly bonkers? No, it's really important that the principle is we don't want large groups of people gathering. Uh, and as soon as you say, well, not large groups, you've got to come to a judgment of where. So you're making the case there that you could have two people meeting two people. Uh, but you've got to bring you've got to have a, a, a line somewhere. It's a judgment where it is. And this is the judgment. In their garden, though, in their garden, not in a park. I'm not asking my parents to come out into a, into a into a into a park because lots of people don't live near a park. They haven't got a park, but maybe they've got a garden. So maybe they could, you could stand across the road and they could be on their path. Or so maybe yeah. you know, it's just the case of being able to see the faces of the two people yeah. that you've missed. Absolutely, I get that. I get it, of course I do. So uh, we, what we've said is that this is in a public place and people have interpreted that as a park and obviously parks are, are, are one of the main public places that people go to, but actually we've said in a public place. So um, yes, the, People coming, we've seen a lot of people where families will come to the end of the uh, at the end of the front path and just keep that distance. We are, we are not recommending that people do that in their own gardens. And the reason for that is, well, firstly, uh, lots of people don't have gardens. Secondly, you often have to go through the house to get to the garden and indoors is much higher risk than outdoors. So that's why we've come to the judgments that we have. I think people understand that these are all balanced judgments about how can we allow people to carry on their normal way of life. I totally get the yearning to see people's loved ones. I mean, I have this as well as you. Um, and the question is how we can have as much of our normal way of life uh, without getting that uh, the virus out of control. And, can, I, um, and, uh, can I jump in and, and move on to, to schooling now? Because you've said that um, schools are preparing to begin to open for children, some children, from the 1st of June, and you expect early year settings for reception, year one and year six, to go back uh, in classes of smaller sizes. A lot of parents, I mean, on my WhatsApp group with other parents, very concerned about sending their children back, frightened to send their children back. How would you alleviate some of the parents' fears out there? Yeah, uh, this is also completely natural. And as you know, my, my kids are uh, 13, 12 and six. And um, the reason that we've made the uh, we've said that what we have is because actually homeschooling and teleschooling for five and six year olds in reception and year one is much harder. And I mean, I know it and my wife certainly knows it because she's at home with the with uh, with them all the time, much harder than for older kids. Um, and we do want to make sure education is interrupted as little as possible. Uh, also, childcare is much more um, difficult um, if you've got a five-year-old, six-year-old uh, or, or a child in uh, preschool. Um, whereas once they're 13, 14, it's OK to leave them at home uh, when you go to work. Um, and so that's why we've made those judgments. You, um, and yet, you've got a six-year-old, you were saying that, and I've, I've got a yeah. five-year-old, and I know that he would be one, he'd be in reception, he'd be one of the children going back. At that age, are they, can they socially distance? Will they be kept safe? Is Chester going to have to go to school in a mask? Is his teacher going to have to wear a mask? Is he going to have to be spray disinfected as he's walking through the door? We're all sort of filling no. in the blanks a little bit. Yeah, the, the, look, the, firstly, he is not going to be having to be sprayed with disinfectant. I did see that from uh, one proposal from a union. That is absolutely not going to happen. We wouldn't be proposing this if we didn't think that it was safe. Um, children, thankfully, are very, very rarely affected by this and, uh, and even rarer indeed if, if they don't have an underlying health condition. If they have got an underlying health condition, uh, that means that it's a problem. They'll have received a letter from the NHS. So it is safe for the children, uh, but they also do risk um, spreading the disease, which is why we've limited this so much. We think that so long as the rate of, of new cases keeps coming down, we think that it's OK to make this small change in the first place because education is also important. Uh, but we'll keep a very, very close eye on it. But the, but the real message, the most important message I want to get over to parents like me in these circumstances is that it is, it is safe for your child at school. 
Um, moving on to uh, one of the other uh, areas that has confused people a little bit, and that's face masks. Um, you were now saying that uh, we should should be wearing face masks, um, but uh, but right at the very beginning, the efficacy of, of their use was questioned. Uh, so um, so so should you have said we should be wearing face masks all the way through? Well, the evidence, as you say, is weak on this. Um, it is not a it's not cut and dried. The most important thing is that the formal face mask, the clinical face mask, should be saved for uh, for people in the NHS, in social care, where they're really, really important. What we're saying is that if you're in a confined space, um, but uh, for a reasonable period of time, but not with people who you're with for, there with for a long time, like in a school or in an office, if it's for a period like 15, 20 minutes, for instance, on the if you're traveling on public transport, then there is some evidence that a face covering doesn't particularly help you, but it stops you from spreading it if you've got it but don't yet have symptoms. Um, and that's what the, the science now says. They've been looking at this all the way through. We're constantly learning about this virus. And as we're saying that more people should go back to work, so that's why we've brought this change in at this point. But face coverings, and you can make your own. I'm, I'm thrilled to see that you're having a session on make your own <laughs> uh, face covering afterwards. This isn't about the formal face mask that we need to reserve for people in the NHS and social care. And so uh, one place where you'd be wearing one of these masks would be on, on the underground, on public transport, uh, public transport. How realistic is that? Because you've said social distancing guidance on public transport must be followed vigorously. Well, as more people are returning to work, the more packed those areas are going to be, the less likely it is that yeah. you can socially distance. Well, we saw the pictures on the tube this morning. Yeah. We saw people crammed together like they usually are, like sardines. And, uh, yeah. and when, when the Prime Minister said, go to work, but 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 only if you can't work from home. Try not to use public transport. I mean, it is it's not possible for people to cycle. I mean, many people can't cycle to work. They've got long distances to go. Maybe yeah. they're not fit enough to cycle to work or walk to work. Maybe it's too far. How do they go to work? Look, I get this. It's again, this is a really difficult one where we've got to make balanced judgments. Um, so uh, only about. 15%, uh, less than one in six of people commute on public transport. Of course, that number is much bigger in London. And people should avoid public transport unless they absolutely have to use it because it is safer when there's fewer people on it. Um, and so we should leave public transport for the people who can't avoid it. But we can't just turn off public transport because some people, including key workers like in my hospitals, absolutely do need it. Now, you say not everybody can cycle. That's true. But lots more people can than do. And actually, now is a good time to start cycling to work because there's hardly any traffic on the road. So it's uh, actually much uh, more pleasant to cycle than in normal times. So um, we we. We, we strongly encourage people not to use public transport unless they absolutely have to. I think bear and in mind that the, 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 Prime Minister did, the Prime Minister did suggest that people drive to, to work, so there'll be considerably well, more cars on the, on the yeah. road now um, if people well, are maybe, driving but, rather than use public transport. Well, maybe, but you know, we've just released uh, guidance uh, for the use of public transport. Uh, lots more spacing out on public transport. Actually, we'll also be increasing the numbers of trains because... You know, that had come right down because there were very few people using them uh, and tubes in London. And that will help to increase the space available on public transport. But this is all about the balance of keeping the R below one so that virus is under control, but also allowing people to get back to their way of life and get on with their livelihoods but in a way that is safe, hence the baby steps that we're taking. Is it helpful that, um, that different countries in the United Kingdom um, have now got different rules and that essentially, you know, you can't travel across the border now, uh, that we actually do have an invisible coronavirus border between us and Scotland and, and Wales. Um, and at the same time, um, we, 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 we want to know who got, got it right. I mean, uh, has Nicola Sturgeon got it right? Have you guys got it wrong? Well, there is a there's a scientific reason for the difference, um, and that's that there is a the R is higher in Scotland uh, and to a degree in Wales, um, and that so they've taken um, different decisions because the science is different. So the rate of transmission is actually higher in Scotland than it is in England. Uh, so it's understandable that they've taken a, a a slightly different approach, but it's all still within the broad frame, uh, very very similar. 
because uh, the changes that we've made are really uh, we're quite small in the last couple of days. They're just the, the you know, they're hopefully the first because hopefully we can continue because we can keep the virus under control. But we're going to do these things really really carefully. Um, there has been a shortage of PPE for frontline workers throughout this pandemic. Um, the Doctors Association UK is demanding the government launch an inquiry into the failure to provide adequate protection for the NHS and care staff. Why can't you sort out the PPE shortage? Well, we have made huge progress, actually. Um, and uh, the, one of the indicators of whether PPEs worked for healthcare staff is that we saw figures yesterday showing that the proportion of people who have died who are uh, NHS employees is exactly the same as the rest of the uh, the rest of the country. It isn't any higher. This is quite unusual uh, in an epidemic like this in countries around the world. It's normally much higher, and uh, I, I think that's testament to how the NHS has managed to uh, look after its staff, including through the provision of uh, of PPE. Actually, today is the 200th birthday of um, uh, uh, Florence Nightingale. That's why I'm wearing this, uh, this white rose. Um, and it's a, um, and, and, you know, so protection of uh, uh, the NHS staff, including our nurses, for, and the infection control that she 200 years ago was a pioneer of, it's been so important. And the, and the information that was published yesterday does suggest that we have managed to protect our NHS workers overall. Of course, there have been individual problems, but the suppliers are much better than they were uh, a month ago. We're making serious progress in the right direction on PPE. But, you know, as I've said many times before, I won't rest until everybody gets the PPE that they need in a massive distribution to three million people who need PPE. There inevitably are challenges, but we're working incredibly hard on it. And do we do we now all have to come to the conclusion that summer is essentially cancelled, holidays cancelled. It'll be like unlike any summer that we've had probably since the Second World War. I think that's likely to be the case. Yeah, we haven't made a final decision on that yet, but um, it, it is clear that we will um, seek to reopen hospitality, some hospitality, um, from early July if we keep successfully reducing the spread of this virus. But I think um, I think I think people are going to, you know, so, social distancing of some kind is going to continue. And I think, you know, the conclusion from that is that it is unlikely that uh, big, lavish international holidays are going to be possible for uh, for, for this summer. I, th I just think that's a, a, a reality of life. What's your estimate for us being able to give someone we just met a hug? Well, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, how long, because if how long, how long do you think until we're through this, until we look to that moment where we say, oh, hi, and you give someone a hug? Well, I, I, really, to get to the point where this is totally sorted is when we have a treatment or a vaccine. Uh, those developing the vaccine think that they should have it on stream for this autumn. Um, I'm cautious. I, I'm giving them all the support uh, that we possibly can. But the science of vaccines is very complicated. The trials are going really well so far. There's several hundred people have got a vaccine uh, in them already to test it and to test that it's safe and that it works. And so th those trials are, are going well. Um, uh, if it comes off by the autumn, that would be, that would be wonderful. Uh, but there is a, there's, a, there's a lot of science to do between now and then to be able to sort it. We're just giving them every support we possibly can because I know how much people want to do that. We need right. that vaccine, that's thank for you sure. Thank you for coming on um, today. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me.